Okay, well, thank you again, everybody, for um, taking time out of your schedules to be here today. Uh, we do have some very important information to share with you. Um, on everybody's mind right now is the American Rescue Plan and how you're supposed to account for and use that money that's being provided. So uh, we're gonna talk about that first and give you the information that we have right now about that. We'll let you know everything we do on that topic. And the other topic for today is also very important and that's about phase two of the enhanced regulatory basis of accounting. Um, if you'll remember back in 2019, we introduced phase one, uh, which included things like interfund transfers and uh, debt, um, OPEB, and so forth. Um, we suspended phase two of the enhanced regulatory basis um, in 2020 due to COVID, but now we find that we must move forward with that. So Todd's going to give you an overview of what all of those changes will be um, in the second half of the presentation today, and then we'll be training on those topics throughout the year. So please make as many of our meetings as you can this year. They're all going to be very important. Um, if you cannot make them, then at least please watch the recordings so that you can be aware of all of the requirements. And then the second hour of today is going to be um, set aside to answer questions from you on any topic. Please type those questions in the Q&A box. That's much easier for us to maneuver in. Um, we will check the chat, but it uh, just makes it a little harder for us if they're in the chat. Um, if you're a caller, please send your question to cities.towns at sboa.in.gov. And it would be helpful there in the subject line if you could put meeting question in all caps so that we can sort through our inbox quickly to find that. So with that, we will go ahead and get started. You will be receiving funding under the Section 603 of the Social Security Act, which was added by Section 9901 of the American Rescue Plan Act of 2021. And we're gonna to refer to that as ARP. The ARP established the Coronavirus Local Fiscal Recovery Fund with appropriations that will remain available until December 31st of 2024 for making payments to metropolitan cities, non-entitlement units of government and counties in order to mitigate the fiscal effects stemming from the public health emergency with respect to team. If you're wondering what your allocation is, those allocations can be found on our website and I'll show you how to get to those in just a moment. Metropolitan cities and all counties will be receiving funding directly from the federal government, whereas non-entitlement units will receive the allocation through the state of Indiana. Uh, the information on the Board of Accounts website also provides which cities are determined to be metropolitan cities and which cities and towns are determined to be non-entitlement units. There are 22 metropolitan cities on that list. It is important to follow the prescribed accounting system procedures and documentation requirements uh, for the use of these funds. According to the American Rescue Plan, a detailed accounting for the uses of these funds will be required by the secretary. And any unit that fails to follow those procedures uh, may be uh, required to repay an amount equal to the amount of the funds that were in violation of the ARP. <clears throat> so that's why we're going through these procedures today to make sure you understand what those requirements are. Um, the Secretary of the Treasury may uh, issue additional regulations and as those regulations come out we will make you aware of them. The guidance that's issued by the state examiner is intended to help you meet the requirements uh, of the Department of the Treasury. So please remember as we go through this that we are all learning about this at the same time. Uh, we get the information at the same time as you do. Um, our agency does carefully read these, this information in the act and it, uh, we've reread the act uh, to come up with the information that we have for you. Um, no doubt more information is going to become more available as things settle down and we will communicate that information to you when we receive it. We do already have several questions into the Department of the Treasury, as does AIM, and our agency and AIM are working together to find the answers that you need to work through all of this, but of course that takes time and we do have to wait on those answers. Um, 
Our goal is to prescribe the method of accounting for these funds and to provide you with the tools that you need to comply with the requirements of the act. Um, and as I said, we'll go through those today. We will take all of your questions today. Please again, type them in the Q and A. That helps because those questions are then recorded for us to go back and take a look at later. There's a good chance that we are not gonna have all the answers to all of your questions today. Um, we will need to take those questions back and study those and make sure that we give you a solid answer as to what your question is compared to what the act requires. And the worst thing that we could do for you is to give you an answer that's not complete. Um, so please understand if we say that we'll have to get back with you. Okay, so to help you find information on the ARP, you're gonna go to our website, that's www.in.gov slash SBOA. And on the homepage, you're gonna see <clears throat> a line that says COVID-19 resources. And that will be the American Rescue Plan Act information. If you click on that, then that's going to open up into this box. And there's several pieces of information here. And first, you'll find a title by title summary of the American Rescue Plan. I'm not sure who the author of that was, but that, that is here on our website. You'll also find state and local allocation. So if you want to know how much money your city or town is getting, you can pull out that spreadsheet and that will tell you. Um, also, Directive 2021-1, accounting for the ARP and specific processes for Subtitle M. That is the directive from the state examiner. And then the accounting processes for ARP, Subtitle M, Coronavirus State and Local Fiscal Recovery Funds. That is the accompanying memorandum that goes with the directive. A state examiner, Paul Joyce, issued Directive 2021-1 to provide guidance on the accounting for the ARP funds that are being granted under Subtitle M of the American Rescue Plan. And that portion is called the State and Local Fiscal Recovery Funds. There will be an advance, this will be an advance grant to cities and towns. Uh, the state of Indiana will be receiving this money by May 11th and then distributing it within 30 days. So that is the time frame we're dealing with. Um, those 22 metropolitan cities will be receiving the money directly from the federal government. There will be a second payment that's to be received by the state of Indiana or metropolitan city, um, not earlier than 12 months after the first payment. And um, those likewise will be distributed by the state within 30 days of receipt. Now the money does not need to be used right away. Um, you do have some time. You have until December 31st of 2024 to use these funds in accordance with the Act. Here are the highlights of the directive. The governing body must adopt an ordinance establishing the local ARP fund to receive the allocation in accordance with the State Examiner Directive. The naming convention and a fund number range for you. The name of the fund should have ARP in it along with the name of the grant and the fund number range should be anywhere from 176 to 199. The ARP grant fund must be established by the ordin by ordinance of the legislative body and the ordinance should specifically list those uses that are described in section 603 that are applicable to your city or town that you envision utilizing. The ordinance should also reference a plan that will provide specific details for the use of these funds. And that plan should be laid out in a way that corresponds to the elements um, as laid out in section 603. And we're gonna go over all of those. The ordinance and plan can be amended as long as, uh, as any other ordinance or plan can be amended, as long as the amendment would comply with that section 603. A council must appropriate the funds before they are used. This is a local appropriation only and does not require getting approval from DLGF. Disbursements from the fund must go through the normal claims process as outlined in IC 511-10-1.6. And that's the statute that uh, says that the fiscal officer cannot draw a warrant or a check for payment unless there's a fully itemized invoice or claim. 
um, unless the invoice or bill has been approved by the officer receiving the goods or services. It's been filed with your office and the fiscal officer audits and certifies that the invoice is true and correct and then payments allowed by your board. There's also in the directive a requirement that money may not be transferred to another fund. And one thing to remember about that as we go through it is that the money to be used under the American Rescue Plan is for costs incurred. And so all of the activities should be shown in the ARP fund. Okay, now on this slide, this is just a, uh, a slide of reference for you. We're gonna go through each one of these things on this slide individually on other slides. Um, we just wanted you to have it all in one place. These are the uses of the funds uh, under this section 603. Also remember that the, D, the uh, U.S. Treasury is requiring a detailed, detailed accounting to show that you have used the funds in accordance with this section. So you'll wanna be thinking about the documentation that you're gonna need to prove that the expense was for a permitted use and the internal controls that you're gonna need to be put in place to make sure that the money is spent in accordance with these purposes. So um, this paragraph one here, it's a, I, I've, I've quoted the whole thing here, but on this slide, I would like to just work with the highlighted words here. Uh, subject to paragraph two and except as provided in paragraphs three and four, uh, the, the metropolitan city or non-entitlement unit of government shall use the funds provided under this section to cover costs incurred by December 31st of 2021. All of those phrases there are very important. Uh, that you can only use the fund to cover costs incurred. And we'll have to keep coming back to the term cost incurred as we go through all of these permitted uses. And then the, um, the ending date again is December 31st of 2024. So your supporting documentation needs to show that the actual costs were incurred and that the uses were in compliance with the American Recovery Plan. I'm sorry, the American Rescue Plan. Okay, now this is also uh, that first paragraph. Again, I've just highlighted a different section of words because you don't wanna gloss over the words subject to paragraph one and accept as provided in paragraphs three and four. You need to know what those mean. I'm sorry, paragraph two. So paragraph two says that money may not be deposited into any pension fund. So you need to know that right up front. The use of the funds cannot be for a pension fund. And it says, except as provided in paragraphs three and four. Paragraph three says that your city or town can transfer money to certain not-for-profits. Now the not-for-profits that can, can be transferred are, is defined in the act. So if you're gonna transfer money to a not-for-profit, then it would be the best to get a written opinion of your, turn, of your attorney that says that the not-for-profit meets the definition in the act. But that statute, uh, that paragraph is there. And then paragraph four, uh, the city or town can transfer the money to the state of Indiana if it so chooses. So now that you know what those particular paragraphs say, just remember that you can use your money for costs incurred um, under the next a few provisions we're gonna go over. The first one, so paragraph A, is to respond to the public health emergency with respect to the coronavirus disease or its negative and economic impacts, including assistance to households, small businesses, and not-for-profits, or A, to the impacted industries such as tourism, travel, and hospitality. So those are the kinds of costs that can be incurred under this subsection A. <clears throat> so a couple of things that are not on this slide, any grant um, that your city or town provides in the form of assistance or aid to respond to the public health emergency um, should be through written agreement with the recipient. That's just more documentation to show that you have used this money in accordance with the act. And then disbursements to the grantees and program recipients should be documented as being in compliance with that written agreement. 
It's also a good idea in your plan to provide assistance or aid that you document that this action is re in response to the public health emergency or its negative economic impacts. Okay, now this is my most colorful slide because it has a lot of words in here that are either defined or uh, we're looking for the definition for those. Um, but these definitely these words need to be sorted out as you consider uh, using the money for costs incurred to respond to workers for performing essential work during the public health emergency. Um, you can provide premium pay to eligible workers of your metropolitan city, non-entitlement unit of local government or county that are performing such essential work, or you can provide grants to eligible employers that have eligible workers who perform essential work. Now, there are a couple of words that are easily defined, or it's easy to find a definition in the act, and those two are for the premium pay and for eligible workers. Those are in blue. Premium pay is defined as an amount up to $13 per hour that is paid to an eligible worker, in addition to wages or remuneration the eligible worker otherwise receives for all work performed by the eligible worker during COVID-19 public health emergency. And that amount cannot exceed $25,000 per worker, eligible worker. Eligible worker is also defined to mean a person, uh, uh, those workers needed to maintain continuity of operations of essential critical infrastructure sectors and additional sectors as each chief executive officer of a metropolitan city or non-entitlement unit of local government may designate as critical to protect the health and well-being of the residents. So that is going to depend a little bit on how that is going to depend on how your um, executive, either the mayor or the council, define that. So that that is the definition of eligible worker, and that is in 603G. If you would like to take a look at that, we do have some questions into the treasury about this section. So uh, please go ahead and ask your questions in the Q and A on this. We will likely have to hold those for later until we get some answers. Um, for example, a couple of questions are uh, related to essential work and eligible employers. But the, the key here is just to make sure that uh, the disbursements are in accordance with this section and they're well documented. Okay, the third item that um, the money can be used for is for costs incurred, again, for the provision of government services to the extent of the reduction in revenue due to COVID due to the COVID-19 public health emergency. So um, the section is getting a lot of attention um, and hopefully more guidance will be coming from the U.S. Treasury. Again, we have a couple of questions into that department, um, but this is what we know right now. Um, so can you, yes, sir. Sorry, I'm going to interrupt because we have a question that applies to this, I think. Um, in 2020, a city received a lit supplemental distribution, and they want to know if they need to include the supplemental distribution when we determine the revenue reduction. I don't know if we know that the answer to that yet or not. We don't. We would probably better get back with them on that so that we give consistent answers to all of our okay. cities and towns and counties. Thanks. But we will uh, provide guidance on that. Okay, you can use the money to provide general government services, but that amount has a limit. You can only use the money for general government services to the extent of the reduction in revenue due to the COVID-19 public health emergency. So that's going to involve a calculation on your part. Uh, the base year is going to be 2019 because that is the most recent full fiscal year prior to the emergency. And remember that this is for costs incurred. So as far, as far as we know right now, you do not have the ability to just add this amount to your general fund, but you instead do need to show costs incurred as activity in the ARP fund. And again, please ask your questions in the Q&A. We'll do our best to respond to those today, but if we can't, we will get a response to you. Now on the revenue 
reduction calculation. Um, again, just remember costs incurred is limited to the amount of revenue reduction calculated. And there are some authoritative sources of information for you to use as you make this calculation. Um, you can go to uh, distribution schedules at the Department of Local Government Finance, the Auditor of State, or you can use your own records, especially in the areas of utilities or parks or other fees. For the Department of Local Government Finance, if you go to their web page over on the left, it'll say county specific information. Then you can, um, it'll open up into this box here where you can select your county. And then you can go to a chart for your city or town that talks about the local income tax distribution amounts by year. For the Auditor of State, you can again go to their website and over on the right under local government. Uh, you can click on that and there will be the distribution reports for various taxes that you can look at um, as you calculate, again, calculate that reduction. So just to kind of recap that one, cost incurred for government services is limited, the amount of revenue uh, reduction calculated. You do need documentation to explain that the revenue reduction is due to the COVID-19 public health emergency and it's not caused by other factors. And you'll want to use 2019 again as the base year to calculate the revenue reduction for 2020, 21, 22, and 23. And then the final use that's listed in section 603 is to make necessary investments in water, sewer, or broadband infrastructure. Um, I don't, so, so keep that in mind uh, for your utility. Again, the uh, transactions will have to be accounted for in the ARP fund and you will document on the capital asset ledger um, whatever improvements those are in accordance with your capitalization policy. Now we've had a couple of questions. What do we do if we've had a permitted expense that was incurred prior to receiving the money? The act says that this money may be used from March 11 of 2021, which is the date of the act, through December 31st of 2024. So for example, if on March 12th, you incurred expenses in the amount of $10,000 from your general fund in response to the public health emergency, um, and it was for a permitted use under the act, the city can transfer that expense to the ARP fund through a reversing entry. The city will first reverse the $10,000 expense in the general fund, which will reinstate the expense appropriation line item and then the cash balance of the general fund. And then the city will post the $10,000 disbursement to the ARP fund with a link to the original claim and supporting documentation. So if you're in that situation, then you could refer to this slide on how to account for that. And also just to stress the importance of documentation, again, sorry, I keep repeating that, but it's just so important. Um, a detailed accounting is going to be required by the U.S. Department of Treasury. So all of the requirements of the State Examiner Directive and that memorandum, again, is to provide you with the tools that you need to meet those requirements. So all expenditure records, whether that be accounts payable vouchers or approval in minutes, correspondence, any written agreements or, uh, you know, grant or programs that you're offering, those need to be maintained in a separate file for the audits of ARP funds. Just make sure that you maintain supporting documentation for every dollar that's dispersed and make sure that you can tie that to a permitted use under 60C, 603C uh, with an adequate explanation. There may be some other assistance coming through the ARP or grants. Uh, we'll let you know about those as we find out about them. But each form of assistance or grant does have to be separately accounted for uh, in a separate fund with the name and number as described in the directive. Remember that was ARP and the naming convention and then uh, fund numbers 176 to 199. And then we'll prescribe procedures for those as information becomes available. Do keep in mind that you're gonna to have to establish some internal controls over this money. 
Um, internal controls need to be designed, implemented, and documented to provide reasonable assurance that the ARP funds will be safeguarded and used in accordance with the Act. Each of the five components of internal controls is necessary to form a complete internal control process. So you need to address each one of those in your internal controls document for these funds. We will talk about that more um, at later conferences and maybe go through those five components as they would apply to the ARP. But in the meantime, you do have our uniform internal control standards for Indiana political subdivisions that you can look at. That's available on our website. We also have our best practices document that you can look at um, again uh, on our website. Separate funds, maintaining records, detail and detailed comments that provide audit trails and appropriate approvals, et cetera, are all part of good internal controls. So just to summarize a little bit with the information that we have now, um, all money received from the local fiscal recovery fund must be receded into a separate grant fund. Before the money is dispersed, the fiscal body must appropriate the money in the fund for a use that's consistent with Section 603C and as stated in the ordinance and the city or town plan. To ensure accountability and transparency of the use of these funds, all disbursements must be made from the ARP grant fund. Money from the ARP grant fund may not be transferred to another fund. And just keep in mind the detailed accounting is required uh, by the Secretary of the Treasury, and there must be sufficient internal controls over all transactions. So I'm sure we might have some questions. Um, please feel free to contact us um, if you have questions and we'll take whatever we can right now. I need to move your chair with the mic. Well, Susan alluded to this in the beginning. Um, it's been about two years ago, we started training on changes that were coming for the financial statement reporting. The plan uh, was a phase in consisting of a couple of parts. The first part, which was going to apply for 2020 reporting and the second one for 2021. And then COVID hit and threw everybody into uh, a different world. And, and so we postponed those plans for implementation just because we knew all local units, not just cities and towns, but everybody had so much to deal with that, you know, piling on all these new requirements was just not going to help in any way. And so we, we postponed that. So now the plan is to implement these changes and it's going to be beginning for financial statement for 2021. And they're going to have a new look, your financial statements, and you'll need to know some new concepts, some terms and how to apply them. We plan on to train on this throughout the rest of the year. <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, so that you you need in order to prepare and gather information now throughout the rest of the year that's needed for these changes this to the enhanced regulatory. But before we take a look at what's coming throughout the rest of the year, let's cover a, a couple of base concepts first. Currently, your financial statements are presented on a regulatory basis of accounting. That is the system prescribed by the state examiner. According to statute, the state examiner prescribes the accounting and reporting systems to be used by governmental units in Indiana. So that basis is limited to Indiana governmental units. Gap reporting is based on generally accepted accounting principles, which are accepted in the United States. In basic terms, the main difference between these two is, <clears throat> excuse me, Regulatory is recognized in Indiana, where GAAP is recognized throughout the United States. And regulatory is on a cash basis, and GAAP is on an accrual basis. So the cash basis is you recognize your seats when they're received, and you recognize disbursements when you spend them. The notes to the financial statements are more extensive on a GAAP report. But don't worry, uh, Indiana local governmental units are going to remain on the regulatory basis unless they are required to, by statute, uh, have a gap basis reporting or the unit elects to have gap basis reporting. 
Indiana Statute 511.5-4 states that cities with population greater than 75,000 can't issue bonds after June the 30th of 2020 unless the city has, for its preceding budget year, prepared an annual financial report using the modified accrual basis of accounting in accordance with generally accepted accounting principles. So currently there are like nine or 10 cities out there that have populations 75 or over, and that's as of the last census. So 10 years ago, if you were close to 75,000, you wanna keep an eye on the new census that's coming out because that might throw you into the, the category requiring you to do gap statements. In the future, uh, we're gonna keep you informed if there's any change to the language in the statute and that $75,000 threshold maybe is lowered to include more cities. If you aren't one of these communities and you want to present financial statements on the gap basis, you can request that we audit your gap statements. Indiana Code 511.130 permits a city or town to request the Board of Accounts audit after the adoption of a council resolution. That request goes through our approval process after you email us the resolution to cities.towns at sboa.in.gov. Now that has to be done annually within 60 days of the end of the year. So we're past that time frame for uh, looking at 2020. But keep that in mind going forward if you ever want to issue gap statements when you're not required to. There's quite a bit more that goes into a gap report, not only from your side, but from the audit side. So keep that extra workload on your end that's required by you in mind when you're considering a request to have a, a gap audit. So now that we have those concepts down a little bit, let's talk about what's going to change that we will be training on throughout the rest of the year. Again, this is just an overview at this point of what you can be looking forward to and keep your eyes and ears uh, open for notices that the training is coming related to this. In addition to the monthly training sessions, uh, we have the Park Treasurer School and budget workshops next month, the uh, <clears throat> district meetings later in the year, and then the annual conference is scheduled for in November. The first thing you need to know is your financial statements are changing in appearance. They will now be presented by fund type, and there are several fund types. A fund type is a category each of your local funds will have, whether it's a statutory fund like MVH, a fund created to account for a grant, or a home rule fund created uh, locally by your councils. Each of your funds will be grouped by fund type on the financial statements. In later training, uh, we will be discussing in detail these fund types because you're gonna need to know which group your funds will fit in. Standard funds will already be in Gateway in the annual financial report with the appropriate fund type, but any non-standard funds, you're gonna need to indicate the fund type. So knowing, them, knowing what each fund type is and how your funds fall into that's gonna be important. <clears throat> this is what your financial statement looks like now. Uh, from left to right, it has a list of each of your funds and then the beginning cash balance as of a specific period. So the next column over for this report is 1 1 of 17. So I just use that as an example. The next column over is the receipts column and it's in total by that fund. So you can see the general fund receipts were. $1.8 million, MBH was 500 and some thousand, and so on. The disbursements in total by each fund is the next column. And then the fourth column from the left represents the cash and investment balance at the end of the audit period. In this case, it was a two-year report, so that, that column is not only the 1231 balance, but it's also the 1-1 balance for the next year. And then as a report the receipts for the next year, the distance for the next year, and then again on the far right, the ending cash balance. This is what your financial statements are going to look like going forward. <clears throat> Notice how there are no longer individual funds listed, but rather 
at the top. And now receipts are not just a total, but they're gonna be categorized by receipt type, taxes, licenses, intergovernmental charges for services, and so on. Disbursements are gonna be handled in the same way, personal services, supplies, other services and charges by each fund type. Part of the change in financial statement type goes along with a change in our chart of accounts. This is another area we trained on a couple of years ago and we delayed implementation due to the COVID. If you wanna see that presentation and the material we provided a couple of years ago, we are, as I said, gonna talk about it throughout the rest of the year, but uh, we talked about it at the fall district meetings in 2019. So if you go to our website under that presentation and training materials section, and go back to uh, fall meetings of 2019, you should see part of accounts or fund, fund information. I think it says chart of accounts. The biggest thing to take away today related to fund number and system and the chart of accounts <clears throat> is that fund numbers are gonna go from a three digit number to a four digit number. Correspond to a fund type like the, the first two in fund number 2202 will be for special revenue. Next group of fund types is debt service and the, the first number there's gonna be a three, so that's gonna represent a debt service fund. These changes are gonna be effective January the 1st of next year, if not sooner. And then starting in audit periods of 2022 and after, could be subject to an audit exception if you're not using the proper fund number on your ledger. So again, we've got between now and the end of the year to train on this and you can implement it now or with your vendors, software vendors to get these changes made to these fund numbers. Nothing's been finalized yet. A couple of the software vendors have been asking about these and I wanna get that information to them as soon as we get them finalized so you can go forward. To go along with the changes in the financial statement presentation is a change or additions of note disclosures. Those regulatory and gap uh, statements require certain disclosures to assist the reader of your financial statements in getting a better understanding of the information that's presented on the financial statement itself. These notes are already in your disclosures, so they should uh, sound somewhat familiar. But here are some new notes or notes that are, are being enhanced. And just for this discussion, you know, these two, although the others listed, uh, you're gonna hear us talk about throughout the rest of the year. So capital assets and the capital asset note is changing in that it's currently a schedule in your report and it's not on the financial statement or in the notes. It's now gonna be a note disclosure with the schedule like you see on the screen uh, being included. It's no longer just a schedule of assets that um, are added during the year or sold during the year. Now this note disclosure will have depreciation included. And the schedule is going to separate items that are not depreciated, like land, from those that are depreciated. And then the accumulated depreciation will be scheduled out at the bottom of your schedule by asset type, infrastructure, buildings, improvements, machinery, etc. And then the bottom line of the schedule uh, results in the net capital assets being depreciated. So over here, on the bottom of the right-hand column, that total is like 36,389. So that's your total assets, less the depreciation, and then that's your net assets. Debt is gonna be changing in a similar way. Uh, while this schedule looks familiar, it used to just be a schedule toward the end of your audit reports. Now it's gonna be a note disclosure, not just a schedule by itself. And before we go on to the next slide, 
want you to see some uh, other enhancements with this note. So remember these numbers, this uh, general obligation bond, ending principal balance of 585,000, and then the amount of principal and interest due within the next year is 42,526. This is the enhancement to the schedule, and it's also good, so it's also going to be a part of your notes. It's going to break down the amounts due into single and multi-year increments. So where that green arrow is, there's the 585 principal that we took from the previous slide. So that's the principal in total for this general government section, and we've broken it down by years. So the first five years, again, are individual. So twenty thousand dollars in principal in 2022, 20,000 in 2023, and so on for five years. And then if there's debt existing after those five years, then you group them in five-year increments. So you can see from 2027 to 2031, there's four hundred and twenty-five thousand dollars of principal outstanding, and the total of that column is the five eighty-five. The same for the interest; it's broken down by year for five years, and then in five-year increments. Here's the other number I ask you to remember, the 42,526. That's the number that was due the next year, if you remember from the other slide. So you can see in this schedule how that goes from like the principal of 20,000, the interest of 22,526 totals $42,526. If you happen to have debt that goes, you know, I mentioned, the first five years and then in five year increments. The general government example just has one group of five years. The water utility example has two groups. So that debt goes on much longer. So there's a, a group of five years, 2027, 2031, and then another grouping of five years, 2032 to 2036. So it's gonna be individual years and then in five year increments after five. Leases are gonna be the same way, and I don't have a, a slide to show you on leases, but the idea is very similar. Uh, you schedule out your principal and interest payments, just like you have here. So again, we'll cover that much more throughout the rest of the year and give you more specifics and details as we go along. These are some new notes that you haven't seen before. And today, I'm just going to give you a brief overview of the first two. But again, all, all five of those we're going to be talking about throughout the rest of the year. The first one is conduit debt. The term conduit debt refers to certain limited obligation revenue bonds or similar debt instruments issued by a city or town for the express purpose of providing capital financing for a specific third party that's not part of the city or town. So you can issue debt, normally it's bonds, in order to provide financial assistance to private sector entities for the acquisition and construction of commercial or industrial facilities that the governing body deems to be in the public interest. <clears throat> Although conduit debt bears the name of the city or the town that's issuing it, they have no obligation for such debt beyond the resources provided by a lease or a loan with the third party. The bonds are secured by property that's financed and are payable solely from payments received on the underlying loans. Upon repayment of the bonds, ownership of the acquired facilities transfers to the private sector entity that's served by the bond issuance. So although conduit debt bears the name of the city or town, neither they, the state, or any other political subdivision is obligated in any manner for the repayment of the bonds. So even though there isn't any obligation on your part, uh, that situation still requires a disclosure. The note should contain a brief description for any conduit debt you might have and should disclose the amount of the debt outstanding at the end of the reporting period. In this example, there was $27.5 million in debt outstanding from 14 different bond issuances that's considered conduit debt. So if you happen to have any such a debt that you know about, Now's a great time to start gathering some of that information and documentation for us because you're going to need this by the end of the year because this note will be in, in those, those note disclosures going forward. Another 
that many of you uh, will have is related to tax abatements. This information is necessary for the disclosure and it may not be easy to obtain. The, the note defines tax abatements, which are reductions of or exemptions of the level of taxation that's faced or one that's wishing to relocate or set up shop in your state or town. For this note, you're gonna need the total dollar amount abated for the last year of your audit period with some specifics related to the certain industries. Now those businesses aren't gonna be named in the note necessarily, but a general description of what they are is required. So for example, on the screen, a grocery store chain opening a new store in the business district of your city or town and then the amount of that abatement. Again, much more training is coming later. Uh, Tax abatement training is also being provided by the Board of Accounts to so the county auditors. So you'll be getting a lot of, of the information that's related to your unit uh, from your county. They'll be able to provide you some of that tax abatement information. And counties as well, for, for abatements that counties issue, they're gonna be reporting these disclosures in their financial statements as well. So it's, it's just not cities and towns. So to kind of summarize all of that, be on the lookout for more training later this year on financial statement reporting, fund types, charts of account, chart of account, note disclosures, and even more topics. So you want to be on the lookout for our call letters, like we send out a call letter for the annual conference and the district meetings, and I believe we send out a call letter for those as well. We'll be talking about these trainings and bulletins and the mass emails that you get uh, from our subscription service, the ones with the blue um, bars, like down the right hand side. We'll, we'll try to be making as much of that available as we can. We'll have a presentation step on online if you need to go back and refer to them or the recordings. Um, so you're gonna have a lot of information this year on these changes that are coming. Again, there's our contact information if you need to get a hold of us by phone or email. And if you're not currently subscribed, or you're not sure if you're currently subscribed, or there's maybe somebody in your office you want to get some of our mass emailing, the ones with the blue bars out, uh, you can visit our homepage, look for this link. Kind of have to scroll down a little bit, and it's kind of small, but it says to just to subscribe to our email list, please sign up on this page. And there's a link. If you're just typing in your search engine, uh, you can type that link in at in.gov slash SBOA slash the rest of it. Now, some training I didn't mention involves our website. It, just like your reporting, is being enhanced. And as soon as that enhancement is complete. I know we're going to have some training or maybe a video you can go watch at your leisure on what our website looks like, but there's going to be a lot more information available and it's going to look a little different. So we wanted to make you aware of that as well. Now I think we can open it up or address any questions that there might be out there.